tonight's lecture is part of our Wargaming Week of Events here at King's, uh, and also part of our inaugural Wargaming Lecture Series, which we launched in late 2018 alongside the new King's Wargaming Network. As I noted back in November when we launched, um, the Wargaming Network builds on a rich history of King's gaming activities, uh, which we hope will serve uh, as a hub for the growing community of King's students and staff studying, researching, and applying games and simulations in their work. Um, the network seeks to engage and convene world-class wargaming scholars, practitioners, uh, and emerging talent, and to contribute to generating new knowledge and understanding of the complex strategic challenges facing the UK and uh, uh, our NATO allies. Um, so I'm glad that our wargaming network has got off to such a great start, and Ivanka, one of our co-chairs, is here this evening too. So without further ado, let me welcome you all once again, um, and then hand over to Ivanka, who's going to chair proceedings this evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the King's Wargaming Network, I'm delighted to welcome you to our first Strategic Wargaming Week. Uh, over the next four days, we're hosting a series of educational and analytic events uh, that aim to understand modern deterrence and nuclear risk. Uh, these events support the Wargaming Network's core mission, which is advancing wargaming as a method of inquiry. Uh, and ad advancing wargaming as a method for learning and teaching. To kickstart Strategic Wargaming Week, we're pleased to welcome Air Marshal Edward Stringer, the Director General of Joint Force Development um, and the Defense Academy. He will address the role of wargaming in advancing the UK's analytical tools to address strategic competition and modern deterrence post-Brexit. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at a strategic inflection point. We're in the initial stages of a new strategic period, post-Brexit, post-Cold War, and this strategic inflection point is characterized by high uncertainty alongside technological and political change. We're seeing the return of major power competition, which creates new nuclear risks and new deterrence challenges, and alongside these new challenges, we are faced with the familiar threats posed by regional and non-state actors. We at King's established the Wargaming Network as a reflection of intellectual humility at this strategic inflection point, a recognition that we need improved tools for understanding and addressing modern deterrence um, and nuclear risks and other important security challenges in this new strategic era. In Europe, the UK has been leading the way in reinvigorating wargaming to support robust analysis and innovation in the context of, of this new um, strategic environment and the challenges fading, facing the UK and its NATO allies. This evening, Air Marshal Stringer will take stock of this progress and identify what more needs to be done. We have suggested uh, that he address three sets of questions. Um, first, what new analytical requirements does the changing security environment present to the UK and its allies? What is the value of wargaming as part of the broader analytical toolkit in meeting these requirements? Second, what has the UK done to reinvigorate wargaming as a tool for strategic and operational analysis? And third, how should the current practice of wargaming adapt to meet the new policy requirements? And what could the policy, uh, professional wargaming, and academic communities do to um, further the utility of wargaming? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce Air Marshal Edward Stringer, who is the Director General of Joint Force Development and the Defense Academy within the Joint Forces Command. In this role, he oversees the conceptual element of the UK's fighting power, which encompasses concepts, doctrine, training, education, exercise, experimentation, lessons learned, and innovation. For those familiar with military terminology, he is de facto the J7 uh, for the UK's military strategic headquarters. He also oversees the Joint Services Command Staff College, 
where King's Defense Studies Department is, is located. Previously, Air Marshal Stringer was Assistant Chief of Defense Staff for Operations, um, essentially the Ministry of Defense's Operation Director, uh, handling issues from UK flood relief to the nuclear deterrent. He has served as Assistant Chief to the Air Staff, where he was responsible for policy interaction with the Ministry of Defense and for the Royal Air Force Forces Board um, business. Air Marshal Stringer arrived there after seeing the inside of the Pentagon as the UK Chief of Defense Staff's liaison officer and the US Chairman uh, to the US Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He has served as Commandant of the Air Warfare Center and the head of Royal Air Force Intelligence. He has held operational commands in Libya, Afghanistan, Iraq, and the Balkans. Air Marshal Stringer first saw military action in the Gulf War in 1991 and in the no-fly zone operations that followed. He has served as a Jaguar pilot and a weapons instructor. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Air Marshal Stringer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Ivanka, thank you very much indeed for, uh, for, for that wonderful welcome. Yeah, that sounds like I've bounced around quite a lot of jobs recently, and that's because I wasn't any good at any of them. That's probably closer, uh, that's probably closer to the truth. And I'd like to thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity um, to, to, to talk tonight, not least because when I came to this job a year ago uh, and looked at the disparate command that I had, it struck me there was a huge amount of horsepower not being used as well as it might. Um, huge brain power around the whole of the Collective Defence Academy, the Concepts and Doctrine Centre. I didn't feel we were pulling it all together to a common purpose. And then one of my uh, junior officers uh, at, at an event in London bumped into uh, the head of Stonewall, and, and she happened to explain to him how they were using wargaming to test various political outcomes around the world and therefore how they could position themselves and some of their response options. And I thought, it has come to something where Stonewall is making a habit of wargaming and the Ministry of Defence has rather got out of it. Um, uh, and as you said in your very kind introduction as well, the, we are at a bit of an inflection point. And in fact, I, I, I come from the pre-meeting for the MOD's uh, strategy direction group, which will sit on Friday, looking at a thing called information advantage. Uh, and the inflection point that I would say is uh, this is one that's come along, and the last one was probably about 1865. Uh, and at the end of the US Civil War, in fact, I have three slides that could, that could almost be taken by the same photographer, and they're about railroads and telegraphs and big bits of kit. You know, one from the end of the US Civil War, one from 1917, and one from 2018. And the only difference is now that the, that industrial way in warfare we now control with a command and control system that looks pretty similar, but is dependent these days on computers and the way we link them. Uh, so we have built a vulnerability into our systems. People can get on our networks, they can, they can, they, 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 they can affect our ability to, to, to command and control. But we haven't yet seized the opportunities of the information age. And I think that perhaps society has only grasped that in the last couple of years with books such as um, Surveillance Capitalism that's just come out, actually working out exactly how markets and societies and even decision-making can be manipulated when folk, clever folk know how to harness all our data through social media and other things and turn it around and perhaps in some ways use it, uh, use it against us. So we're moving from the industrial age that started for us in the military about 1865 into the information age and that's going to fundamentally alter the way we think about warfare and the way that we conduct it. A key element of that will be in the synthetic environment when we get the advances in computing that we know about now, the ability to handle big data, and essentially we'll be moving into a world where we are actually wargaming all the time, which is why this conference is, for me anyway, extremely timely and why I am really pleased to be able to come and, uh, and talk to you this evening. Um, but it's always good to start with a story, a bit of real people and a, uh, a little, bit of, uh, little bit of history. So as I started with 1865, let's, let's leap forward um, a, not, know, maybe about halfway um, and start with a little story from the Second World War. Um, in the second volume of his history of the Second World War, 
uh, Winston Churchill conceded that the only thing that ever really frightened me during the war was the U-boat peril. And if you walk along the, as I have done recently, uh, with some of my other responsibilities, the river frontage of the Mersey in Liverpool today, just opposite the Port of Liverpool building, you can stop and stare at a very lifelike statue of a very remarkable man, Captain Frederick Johnny Walker, CB, DSO, and three bars, a man who uh, actually did work himself so hard in fighting the U-boat that he drove himself to death late 44, just up the coast near Southport. Now, Walker was without doubt a naval hero, hero in the finest traditions of the Royal Navy and undoubtedly worthy of the recognition and remembrance afforded him today at Liverpool's Pier Head. Uh, but tonight, I'd like to draw your attention this evening to another naval captain, this one named Gilbert Roberts, a man in some ways the very antithesis of Walker. Uh, Roberts, very much a thinker, had been invalided away from the front line through tuberculosis. He was considered unfit to go to sea. You will find, therefore, no statues of him. Uh, yet I and many others would contend that his contribution to winning the Battle of the Atlantic was every bit as, and perhaps in some ways, if not more, significant than Walker's. Why? Well, put simply, Roberts brought wargaming into the equation. I'll talk in more detail about this shortly, but I think it's fair to say, and I don't do counterfactual history as a rule, it's fair to say that without its wargaming's use in support of the Battle of the Atlantic, it almost certainly would not have turned out as it did with incalculable consequences for the war effort. Yet despite this, in our history and many other examples of wargaming's utility, we somehow seem to have lost the habit of wargaming in the UK. This is a potentially critical shortcoming. Today, the erosion of the West's military strength relative to China and Russia, probably a slow relative decline since perhaps the high point of 1991, and the threat both, both states pose to the rules-based international order represent a potential threat, the complexity of which we have rarely seen and make the need to regain the wargaming habit more urgent uh, than ever. I would contend that we need to regain the habit of wargaming to anticipate and counter hostile activities, to build understanding of our own and potential adversaries' capabilities, and the context in which we and they operate. To improve our understanding between staff and the commander, and perhaps also as a strategic tool of influence, demonstrating resolve, reminding potential adversaries of our capabilities, and assuring them of our preparedness to meet any threat they might pose. Uh, tonight, though, I will first briefly reflect on that opening example, the debt Britain owes to wargaming, going back to the Second World War. Second, I'll seek to understand why it is we lost the habit of wargaming in the years that followed, before exploring why defence and government more broadly are now seeking to regain the wargaming habit. And we'll then turn to consider the utility offered by wargaming in combination with new technology, as well as exploring the limitations of both. And I hope, Ivanka, I will answer some of your questions if I cover all those points. So back to Gilbert Roberts. As Churchill ultimately acknowledged, defeat in the Battle of the Atlantic was perhaps the greatest danger Britain faced. It risked the UK's supply lines to the US, and with this, the essential support on which Britain relied. The Royal Navy, the Royal Navy uh, struggling as it was in 1942, was open to new ideas, and it established the decidedly unconventional Western Approaches Tactical Unit, commanded by Captain Roberts and based in Derby House, Liverpool, adjacent to the rather better known Admiral Max Halton's headquarters. Roberts recruited a group of very junior naval personnel, including many young Wrens, some as young as 17 years old, to examine the Royal Navy's convoy operations and those operations of the U-boats against them, uh, and to come up with new tactics to defeat the U-boat threat. So good did this team get that it wasn't long before those 17-year-old girls were defeating the admirals at the war games. Not only were they successful in the games, but they turned, or certainly helped significantly, to turn the Battle of the Atlantic in Britain's favour. They were almost always one step ahead of the Kriegsmarine, such that as British tactics forced tactical innovation from the U-boats in response, commanders recognised what was happening and already knew how to adapt in turn. On the one occasion where a new technology did wrong foot them, the first use of acoustic homing torpedoes, the rapid sharing of intelligence from the convoy and immediate wargaming as an analysis tool enabled Robert's team to evaluate and come up with an effective countermeasure. 
which was then able to be adopted by the Royal Navy and used against the U-boats while the same convoy was still crossing the Atlantic. The UK's sustained and continuous use of wargaming alongside technical innovation informed by the insights gained in the game represents the best use of the technique. In short, they had helped turn a crucial battle and therefore, given its importance, arguably the war itself in Britain's favour, and they had been making wargaming a habit. I would add, as an aside, and given uh, my opening uh, remarks about moving to the information age, that this was done in concert with another one of my great heroes, uh, Captain Roger Wynne and his submarine tracking section of the Operational Intelligence Centre of the Admiralty. Wynne was not a trained Royal Navy officer by background, but a barrister, brought into the intelligence fold uh, as a reservist. Uh, I think the only one to enter uh, uh, by that route. Uh, he built a team of analysts to use all forms of intelligence and information, data if you like in modern parlance, to predict where submarines will be and so route convoys around them. So effective was he in preventing losses that the uh, US Navy Chief Admiral Ernest King, no Anglophile, copied the system. I'm interested in this example as we think about how we use data today, now processed much faster and better by artificial intelligence, and not least, perhaps, in revolutionizing the way we think about the today's anti-submarine warfare battle. But anyway, digression over uh, and back to Roberts, because it's fair to say that Roberts and his team became a global center of excellence for wargaming, as demonstrated by the demand for Roberts' service after the war. He went on to assist with wargaming in NATO, uh, NATO headquarters uh, in Canada, in Norway, in Pakistan, and elsewhere, and notably in the USA during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yet even as others sought out Roberts to learn wargaming from his Western Approaches tactical unit uh, and the experience he gained there, the Cold War saw Britain lose the wargaming habit. So the question we must ask as we seek to regain it is why? Well, in short, war games became formulaic, increasingly focused on narrow scenarios, took months to plan, and may, in fact, have been seen as boring. Part of the reason for this was the growth of computer-assisted war games. These were considered more scientific, but required massive processing power. As, su as such, they were not run by operational units and strategic planners, but by the Royal Armament Research and Development Establishment, to evaluate force structures and organization in deeply technical games, some of them lasting months. There are also a series of very large war games run by NATO as command post exercises, such as Forlex and Wintex, though we are trying to get back into some of these high-level games at the moment. These ran from the 60s to the late 80s, but the scale of these made them almost completely inaccessible to all but the highest-ranking participants, which limited their utility um, and just as crucially, the understanding of the utility of war games across the board. And in part because of that scale and part because of the design of them, there was no real scope for operational or tactical innovation. Later, as computer simulation became a little more widely used, collective training establishments were formed with the aim of being able to run adversarial war games to effectively train units and formations, such as the Army's Command and Staff Trainer, or CAST. Well, once again, the expense and complexity of these establishments meant that there are very few of them to service the large number of military units, uh, with the result that while the establishments themselves were very busy, individual units only managed to visit them rarely. Partly because of the long gaps in training at this level, and thus discomfort with the uh, process and the impact on morale. Uh, and I think in some of the rigidities of the Cold War, there were always thoughts of how adverse um, war game results might affect career prospects. Um, people didn't want to chalk up losses in games or, uh, or indeed uh, in exercises. And so these weren't really used in an adversarial and the most challenging modes. Instead, instructors fell back to the easier familiarity of procedural training, something we still wrestle with today and we might want to come back to in Q&A. Additionally, the cost of building terrain and entities for these models, both financially and just the time required, was so enormous and took so much effort that defence was uh, almost always condemned to fighting the last war in them, little room to develop new scenarios uh, to be fought out over new terrain uh, and over perhaps imagined terrain. This period was also, looking more broadly across society, marked by a huge increase in recreational wargaming 
either associated with armchair generals with little experience of warfare or teenagers playing Warhammer and Dungeons and Dragons, leading to a significant social stigma against wargaming and the professional military, a community perhaps that uh, likes to define itself in more muscular terms as sporty, outgoing and extrovert. The opposite of the stereotype of the wargamer in the 80s and 90s. Wargaming to this crowd was seen as superfluous and silly. A distraction run by the scientists of DSTL with no real relevance to real world war fighters. By the 1990s, Britain had largely lost the habit of wargaming. The decade and a half that followed 9-11 spent as it was fighting uh, diffuse, maybe slightly more amorphous counterinsurgencies as part of a coalition didn't seem to demand wargaming on any scale, discuss, uh, and as a result of this long process of declining practice and prestige, and while wargaming does continue in pockets of excellence across UK defence, it is no longer central, systematic, nor habitual. And just thinking through what's going on in this city today, one wonders how this can be so when wargaming uh, may never have been so high profile in the public dis discourse. Media reports tell us that wargamers are informing Brexit contingency planning, uh, both Conservative and Labour parties are wargaming decisions over parliamentary business and the politics of EU withdrawal, while the EU is also said in turn to be wargaming its responses and plans. But while wargaming may now be practiced more by politicians than its military inventors, the atrophying of UK military wargaming capabilities has not gone, un not gone unnoticed and attempts have been made to address it. Most notably, the publishing of the MOD's wargaming handbook by our Defence Concepts and Doctrine Centre in August uh, 2017. Now the Development Concepts and Doctrine Centre, uh, I'm happy to say. So I'm reminded here of Rommel's damning praise of the British military and its doctrine. The British write some of the best doctrine in the world. It is fortunate that their officers do not read it. Others do even today, and I would commend uh, any British officers in the audience uh, to sit down and read it, the, certainly the better bits of it. Um, what's changed? Well, since the US-led coalition's devastating victory over Iraq's armed forces in 1991, through similar success in Kosovo in 1999, and again in Iraq, 2003, uh, our competitors, and one thinks of China and Russia, have been racing to catch up with the West and work out how to blunt what looked like quite a significant advantage. We might easily reference uh, in this context the well-documented well developments of both China and Russia's anti-access and area denial systems, or note that both countries now operate fifth-generation fighters. But perhaps more tellingly, we can observe that 229 of the world's most powerful supercomputers are in China, compared with 108 in the US and 85 in the EU, a, a disequilibrium that continues to tip in China's favor. Or we can note that it was only in 2017 that China announced its intention to be the world leader in artificial intelligence by 2030. It is already well ahead of its own schedule. It has today more AI patents registered annually than the US, and has also surpassed the US in the uh, quantity of AI papers published and is on track to overtake the US in rankings of the most cited AI papers. So China looks set or is positioning itself to dominate in the era of machine intelligence. This erosion of Western uh, hegemony, uh, technical hegemony perhaps, is accompanied by a renewed challenge to the rule-based world order. In China, this takes the form of what President Xi uh, called in 2015 magic weapons, described well by China scholar Anne-Marie Brady in her paper uh, of the same name. These magic weapons include manipulating existing systems to use the rule-based order against those who follow both the letter and spirit of international law, and undertaking influence activities to erode the power of its major strategic competitor, the US and its allies. Russia's more, one might say, blunt force activities need no further rehearsal here. Suffice it to say that strategic competition is once more a serious threat to the national interest and the UK is no longer assured of the technological edge on which it has relied since the end of the Cold War. Wargaming can help us understand our relative capabilities in such scenarios. To anticipate moves and counter moves and develop contingency plans to help avoid crises 
and to respond rapidly and effectively to them if they do arise or occur. Wargaming can help us ensure we have no crucial capability gaps, that our force is balanced and prepared, both technologically and conceptually, for the challenges they may face. And in addition, there are few more powerful antidotes to groupthink, and I would argue groupthink was the dominant think in the period of the Cold War. So there are a few more powerful antidotes to groupthink than wargaming. Few better ways to surface assumptions and few, perhaps no, better way to enable commanders and staff to think about a problem from the perspective of the adversary. Wargaming with partners across Whitehall uh, and with allies can help identify coordination challenges, differences of opinion and perspective, and develop staff understanding and relationships. Vital, as I would argue, a lot of the threats we face, whether you use phrases like grey zone, sub-threshold or hybrid, require a whole of government response. And of course, regular, rigorous, routine wargaming puts potential adversaries on notice that you are aware of the threats they might pose, perhaps giving sustained and systemic habitual wargaming a deterrent effect um, in and of itself. Consequently, the, the changing strategic concept, context demands the adoption of wargaming as a habit at all levels. So let's look at some of that uh, technology, if you like, the rise of the machines of artificial intelligence. The changing technological land landscape suggests new approaches to wargaming may be beneficial too. Chess was perhaps the world's first formalized war game, beloved of strategists from Richard the Lionheart to uh, Napoleon. And famously in 1997, IBM's Deep Blue Computer beat Gary Kasparov at chess, completing the first grand challenge for computer intelligence, but also less widely noted, marking the first time a computer had beaten a human in a war game. In the years that have followed, it was found that a human and computer playing together as a team would consistently beat a computer opponent playing alone. This gave rise to Centaur Chess and the idea of human machine teaming, which uh, the US and indeed our own current doctrine argues for. Yet last year, the Israeli historian Yuval Noah Harari observed in Science Magazine that the human and the machine no longer consistently beats the machine. The rise of machine prowess in wargaming has since passed two other major milestones. Uh, in 2017, London-based uh, Deep Minds Alpha Zero taught itself the rules of the Chinese game Go, a game that has more moves than there are atoms in the universe and beat the world's best human player, completing yet another grand challenge for AI. And um, from memory, I think I'm right in saying that uh, the first system to do that was AlphaGo, where the machine was programmed with the rules of the game, so it was taught how to play, essentially, and became the first system that could beat um, at grandmaster level. AlphaGo, that was given no such help and had to teach itself, surpassed AlphaGo's ability in 36 hours. Quite staggering. In China, where the game has long been seen as the apogee of strategic thinking, the state took notice and in response has since rewritten its approach to warfare from top to bottom. It now talks not of informationized warfare, but of intelligentized warfare, putting AI at the heart of everything it does from tactical to strategic. In January of this year, DeepMind's AI won at another grand challenge, beating the world's leading esports gamers at the game of StarCraft II, a massive multiplayer game that takes place in, in a huge virtual world. And I think this begins to show how artificial intelligence will first be applied in, in strategy. The game is characterized by five components that should sound familiar to any student of war. It's based on game theory, so like rock, paper, scissors, there is no one consistent dominant winning strategy. Players make decisions based on imperfect information. They have to uh, reconnoiter, surveil, and collect data, and they never have the full picture. It requires long-term planning. A bad move in the early stages can lead to defeat hours later. It takes place in real time and in a vast action space with multiple interacting entities. What's changed in wargame is the ever-growing potential of computer intelligence and simulation. It's forcing us, like the Chinese, to reevaluate the role of computers in warfare. This reinvigoration is likely to start with running artificial intelligence in wargames that take a real-world scenario rather than the fictional world 
of StarCraft II and enable us to test those plans against realistic scenarios. Um, and indeed, you know, we, are vest we are investing in technology demonstrator programs at the moment that we believe to be at the cutting edge of simulation and emulation technology. To do this, we will need to be a center of excellence, not just in simulation and artificial intelligence, but in wargaming too. Computers led to the atrophying of our wargaming habit 40, 50 years ago. They are now helping us regain it. It does, however, have its limitations, and we shouldn't be seduced completely by technology. There are noted limitations to computer-based wargames. Many of these are epistemic in nature, which, as ever in military discourse, means we must now refer to Rumsfeld's taxon taxonomy of the known. First are Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns. We can't wargame what we don't know we don't know. This is as true of map and counter-led wargames as computer-based games, but there's a danger we are lulled into forgetting the model's limitations by the realism of computer worlds. At the far edge of future capability, and artificial intelligence still can't account for these any more than we can. Second are the known unknowns, the things we do not know, and so make assumptions to cover for. And these assumptions have often been flawed in warfare. One of the strengths of board-based and human-mediated war games is that they force participants to discuss in detail assumptions regarding everything from terrain and weather through enemy force densities, morale, etc., etc. As well as the implications these factors and many more will have on combat performance and the likely outcome of any action. Computerized war games risk hiding these assumptions or minimizing their discussion. Uh, we must ensure that this is not the case as they are very valid outputs. The insights you get from those very valid outputs to war gaming. Third, we need to remember that just as with the mental models on which commanders would historically base their plans, all models are likely flawed and not just because there are things we don't know and things we don't know we don't know, uh, but also because of emergent complexity. Uh, emergent complexity, better known as chaos theory, and uh, exemplified perhaps most famously in the notional flap of Lorenz's butterfly wings. And it is why we can rarely predict with confidence the outcome of multiple interactions over protracted periods of time. It will be usually useful to be able to rerun a war game at computer speeds, enabling a Monte Carlo simulation to present a probability distribution of likely outcomes. But we must remember that this distribution is dependent on the interacting uh, decisions of commanders of each side in the war game and may have been dramatically different with only minor variations in those decisions. But if we can move to the sort of technology we're investing in at the moment, then the ability to run lots of war games very quickly should allow us to change variables and see just how sensitive certain options are to certain variables. Fourth, holding the war game might itself change the probability distributions. Neither the game, nor the players, nor the adversary will be the same if played a second time, even a minute later. As the stoic Heraclitus noted some 500 years BC, no man steps into the same river twice, for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. So too with wargaming. And finally, as we consider the application of agent-based games incorporating artificial uh, intelligence, uh, commanders or AI-controlled entities such as civilian population models, soldiers, sailors, marines, airmen, etc., etc., we need to remember how limited uh, these models are likely to be. We are a long way from being able to model the human brain's decision-making processes on an individual level, a long way from predicting individual responses to events and actions. Agent-based models will necessarily be significant simplifications. This does not mean they will be without merit. The US national planning scenarios have used agent-based models to develop striking and perhaps counterintuitive insights to inform contingency planning. So it's observing that contrary to rational predictions, many people do not flee from the area of a nuclear disaster uh, in a built-up area, but rush towards it, perhaps, seeking loved ones before leaving. And indeed, passengers having to evacuate crashed airliners, stopping to grab their luggage, might also have given us a clue here. Finally, we need to be cautious of overhype around uh, deep minds, artificial intelligence, victories in uh, those simulations already mentioned. Debate rages around whether the artificial intelligences in these and similar games were unfairly limited in their performance or whether it was the humans who were disadvantaged unfairly by the rules applied in the games played. Some use the former to argue that artificial intelligence remains brittle, unable to adapt to novelty. Uh, I would note 
and I think the Cold War experience would bring this out. I would note the regularity in history with which human commanders have suffered defeat for exactly the same reason, and observe that conceptually these games point the way to the future. But I would not want to overhype how capable AI systems are in wargaming right now. Uh, they offer utility, not omniscience, but we absolutely have to invest and we have to do some experimentation. Given the limitations of computerized war games, and in some cases with wargaming more broadly, it is best seen as a tool for developing understanding and showing how plans won't work rather than validating those that will. To maximize wargaming's utility, to generate the insights and create the sustained advantage that once was achieved by the Western Approach's tactical unit, we need wargame to be routine again at all levels. This suggests our first actions must seek to increase the number of personnel qualified to teach and lead war games. Second, we need to broaden the understanding of wargaming's utility. And third, we will need to rely on simple games that minimize the need for technology if we are to roll wargaming out at the scale and with the speed to meet this suggested demand. To gain the advantages offered by developments in computer science at scale, we'll need to minimize the processing power required to use computer-based computer war games. This is likely to mean using cloud-based systems that can be accessed securely anywhere, and that is something we are driving to at the moment. We need computerized war games to harvest the data from games systematically and scientifically while minimizing constraints on human creativity. We then need to take those data sets and analyze them using appropriate techniques, including, as already mentioned, AI and machine learning, to evaluate what, what may work and where can and should delegate decision-making uh, be delegated down to computer systems. And none of this will be easy, hence the need for planned experimentation. So after more than a generation uh, of mostly ignoring wargaming, we do face some significant hurdles. We need to overcome those years of de facto stigma in the professional military community uh, and drive cultural change. Um, I would point out that um, even though I've had a rather operational background, I didn't actually end up doing proper wargaming uh, until I got to the high command and staff course at about the age of about 40. And that probably just fleshes out some of what we're talking about. So we also need to avoid uh, two of the most um, common dangers. Uh, wargaming evangelists, thinking gaming is the answer to everything. Um, avoiding the necessity for supportive and parallel analysis and gathering event, uh, evidence. And those who see bureaucratic advantage in jumping on the bandwagon, labeling existing things as war games uh, when they are not. Especially running events without a proper adversary or merely seeking to uh, gerrymander war games to produce a desired outcome and add a veneer of evidential legitimacy to predetermined outcomes. And I think um, many military in the audience will know of what I speak uh, when I mention that. Uh, we do have some advantages, though. Um, we have recognized, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, that the future of warfare will not be more of the same, which is half the battle. We have a dedicated wargaming department in DSTL, Defense Science and Technology Laboratories, which has recently doubled in size to ensure the, an the analysis and scientific basis of wargaming is properly supported. We are right rewriting our force development processes to ensure future force designs are more rigorously tested and that procurement decisions are more clearly underpinned by evidence. We are reinvigorating the conceptual component of war fighting through, as already mentioned, um, the development concepts of doctrine center and joint warfare within forced, uh, joint force development. We are mo moving from a garrison force awaiting their turn to deploy or the emergence of a crisis to which they must respond uh, uh, akin to that of a blue light service to a force that considers the deterrent effects of its posture and exercises 24 seven and more clearly links its training and education to the joint forces development needs. We can't afford to not use our exercising in parallel with our wargaming. We are empowering our joint warfare organization to lead defense in wargaming, exercising, uh, and developing to meet rapidly changing threats in an era of constant uh, competition. And we are structuring to regain that habit of wargaming. We do have a small cadre of world leading subject matter experts in wargaming, providing help and advice across government. Uh, such as our support to the Cabinet Office with war games to inform uh, proliferation policy, 
uh, are providing advice internationally, uh, such as support given to the National Institute for Defence Studies in Japan over future regional relationships, or our support to the Asia-Pacific Centre for Security Studies in Hawaii in their consideration of the situation in North Korea. We also have a vibrant and internationally renowned forum for professional wargaming connections, sponsored here by King's College. The intention is to reinvigorate wargaming throughout the MOD at all levels and continuously develop it, placing it on a professional footing with an appropriate governance structure. It will be supported by technology to the fullest extent, enjoy proper analysis and exploitation of results, and have a route to ensuring it is supported and led by suitably qualified, trained, experienced personnel through life. In this last, uh, King's College, with its particular expertise, will have uh, very much a significant part to play. So ultimately, we hope to see success on a par with that, if I go back to 1942, of the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, with innovative war games continually implemented, supported by proper analysis and the latest technology to generate a sustained advantage in these uncertain times with a rather unpredictable future. To do that, we must uh, regain the habit of wargaming. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll take qu questions at this point. Uh, question and answer session is on the record. Uh, please state your name and, and affiliation. Uh, hello, thank you for the, for the presentation. My name is Hadrian Saperstein. I'm a master's student here at the King's College in the Department of War Studies. Uh, my question was re regarding particularly the lessons learned portion of your speech. Um, and specifically, since 2006, the, <coughs> excuse me, since 2006, the Naval War College has been really focusing on the epistemology of wargaming. My question is this. How much has the British Army, or the British higher command, or whoever, how, how much have they thought about the epistemology of wargaming? Are you talking about, in mean, knowledge sense, what actually goes into it and the, the validity of the data? Um, very much, especially in, the, especially in that synthetic environment. And, and I think the, um, the corollary of what I've spoken about, if war game is going, to be, is, is going to be useful, is you need to validate and verify. So those involved in synthetics development, for example, will know V and V. Validation and verification. Um, I think the other element of uh, 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 your question, you know, as, as it occurs to me, I, I talked about with the sensitivity analysis, i.e., to what extent is it sensitive to the quality of which data, evidence, knowledge that goes in in the, in, you know, in, in the first place. Um, in the centers of excellence I've spoken about, DSTL and others, they will abs absolutely think about that. I think were you to pose the question, and you, you talked about the services, um, I think only those who have made a habit of wargaming would have really thought through all the implications and the utility of it, which is why, as I say, I genuinely welcome the opportunity to come and speak tonight, because we will be introducing wargaming through the Defense Academy, where you know, we get something like 1,500 officers every year. Uh, and if they all get introduced in the lowest level to even quite simple wargaming, then the considerations that you've raised, i.e., you know, very simply rubbish in, rubbish out, um, is the sort of consideration that become more sophisticated as they, as they go through their careers. I think at the moment, you would struggle to find many people who had more than the simple idea of process, how the game is conducted, and maybe not the ability to evaluate the results from first principles themselves and we'll rely on, and there are some in the audience tonight, you know, experts from places like DSTL. Is that, does that answer your question? A gentleman in the back, and we'll take a second question up front as well. Hello, Alice Green, a former graduate of the History of War course here. My question for you, sir, is how significant do you think the adoption of war gaming within uh, the military's reserves could be in bridging the gap in capability and conceptual understanding? 
Well, I think, Barry, you're pushing several of my buttons here, and they've got some of my old intelligence officers in the audience, see if you can spot them. Um, on one of those operations mentioned, I very deliberately took a mixture of regular and reservist intelligence officers out with me. Because uh, at that level of command, relatively junior, sort of squadron command, um, with the odd uh, here tonight exception of genuine brilliance, um, most succumb to groupthink, most very junior intelligence officers. They'd only just been trained, they had maybe half a tour of experience. And so I took with me an ex SAS TA postman from Norwich and a Cambridge history don and an Air Force flight lieutenant trained in exactly what an intelligence officer should do. They, three of them together were fantastic. And I refer, you know, I, in, in the speech I mentioned Roger Wynn. I think in all of these areas, whether you're wargaming, whether you are red teaming, whether you just want your intelligence section to test all elements of the future, you absolutely need a broad cross-section. And I think there's an absolute utility here for reservists. Um, to the extent that I think there's, there's mileage in deliberately going out and recruiting reservists to come and help with a, with, with a wargaming team. And I would add, I think probably what went wrong in the Cold War, it was such a period of notional certainty that the thinking across all services ossified, one's ability to do tactical mission excellence is what generated career progression. And questioning of that was probably unwelcome. We're absolutely not in that period now. Um, we do have, across the services, a huge number of reservists in intelligence organisations. Those are the sort of organisations that tend to be interested and support your wargaming. And I am absolutely a, a great fan of that. So, more of it, please. Um, I think there was one here and then one at the, uh, one at the back. No, I'm sorry, because the, the, we're on the record, so could, could you uh, hand the gentleman the mic, please? Thank you. Hello. Hi. Uh, yes, my name is Emil. I work in public affairs. I uh, was very interested in the bit the, when you discussed AlphaGo and Weighty slash Go. Um, are there any uh, publications or, or public documentation you'd recommend in regards to when China switched its doctrine on the back of AlphaGo's victory? Or can you go into a bit more detail on, on that particular aspect of your lecture? Thank you. Uh, I, I could do if you come afterwards, and I know there are several people in the audience who've absolutely gone and uh, gone and studied this beyond the um, you know, the, uh, the elements cited. I think it's a uh, you know, progression. We've seen the Made in China 25 policy. We then had the stated uh, ambition to lead in, in in artificial intelligence, and then you know the 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 wake up call, if you like, of what artificial intelligence can go could do. And I think, to me, still interesting that. Um, there was such an element of culture and pride in this decision making. Um, and I would, uh, though I don't set myself up as an expert in artificial intelligence while talking to some people who were, I did ask whether there was a difference between uh, cultures when it came to programming. So does Chinese artificial, Chinese if you like, coded artificial intelligence give you different answers to UK coded? Now the answer is yes, I find that fascinating. Mm -hmm. And that's something else that we really, that, that, that we really must ex you know, ex uh, explore. So I think a, a quick Google search would probably put you into um, various of the, of, the, of the academic papers. But if you come up afterwards, I'll introduce you to some of the folk who've actually done the, the study and can probably have got a better knowledge of me of where, of where the real academic papers lie. There are some a few, just a few rows behind you. So we had a question in the back. Yeah, hi. Um, Will Fowen, uh, British Army uh, Red Teamer and uh, Force Development Contractor. Um, processes and procedures wise, how do you stop war games being used to give a frisson of evidence to bad ideas? In other words, to validate things in terms of safeguarding rigor and the actual evidence behind what comes out of a war game? No, thank you. I I think there are probably two strands to, 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 you know, to my answer. The first is not to do with wargaming, it's to do with force development. And um, what are the broader processes by which ministries of defense or indeed 
services who have delegated budgets actually go and compile the evidence to allow them to spend money. So if you like, there is an external to wargaming almost um, uh, compliance and accounting methodology for making sure that um, whenever you check anybody's investments, you check exactly what's gone behind it. And now I'm sure what you're referring to are some of the quite simplified war games, such as the SAG scenarios that over the years that took four structures already agreed on and largely um, already uh, with committed funding and ran quick scenarios to prove that they still worked, which is as far from where we need to be uh, as, as you can get. The second within the world of wargaming, though, I think is to, um, and we talked about the governance, is to make sure if someone sets themselves up to run a war game, they can't do it without it being policed or it's not a war game. You can't stop people conducting any activity they want, but if they start to market it subsequently in any official publication is war gamed, then where's the kite mark? And I think we have a, a, a fair bit to learn here from, uh, you know, from the US where you know, their, their war games are kite marked, badged and put into the collective um, data bank, which is something we haven't yet established in the UK but need, but need to do quite quickly. So in other words, there's an element, I suppose, in that, and I'll shut up on this, of adopting the academic rigor. And if you publish a paper, has it been peer reviewed? And is it accepted such that it forms part of the, you know, the official canon of knowledge in that subject? And I say the Americans are better at this and that they run more war games and then they put the findings into that semi-public domain where everybody can test and, and check and validate them. Uh, we need to get much closer to a governance structure that does the same. So we'll take the next question here in the front and uh, can we also take the second question here, gentlemen, in, in on the front as well? Uh, hi, I'm Stefan Stefanovic. I'm a graduate student here at the uh, War Studies Department at King's. Uh, my question for you is, uh, with the introduction of AI, uh, will it be difficult to, when AIs run war games, where uh, the irrationality of political policymakers that enforce on a rational military strategy that would that's move it to an irrational strategy? How do you make the AI follow irrational uh, policy decisions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we take a second question yeah. as well? Please. Uh, hi, my name is Man Sok Lee. I'm from uh, South Korea. Uh, currently, I'm working in a uh, South Korean Department of Defense as an uh, active Army Captain, uh, Army Major. Uh, I have been, went through several, some uh, world gaming events and uh, collected, collected data from the event and, yeah, you're, from your lecture, I assume that uh, you may get some data from the games played by Anglo-Saxon people, the mostly white people, and uh, UK and the United States, mostly uh, nuclear superpowers. But my uh, concern is that uh, people in China, people in Japan, people in somewhere else states which uh, don't have nuclear weapons maybe have different mentality compared to the Anglo-Saxon people. Mm. So can you, I mean, uh, do you think uh, do you, your result and uh, your data from the war game have some biases and maybe uh, cannot be generally applicable to other regions, but uh, how can you uh, imagine your future strategy set or other countries? Thank you. Well, thank you very much for both questions. Congratulations on your promotion. Um, which order to take them in? Uh, th th they're very related questions, actually, aren't they? Um, they, they, they refer to what might, what, what might be considered from a particular perspective to be um, counterintuitive inputs. And that one very particular perspective you're both suggesting, you know, uh, one directly, one indirectly, is the military mind, seeing a political input as irrational or not understanding a, a cultural diversity. Um, 
I think, they are, I think they are both very good points, and I have undenied, especially about the, the first one, ever since reading Armadillo by William Boyd. There's an element here we could go into science fiction and its utility in thinking about futures. Though not a science fiction book, there is a, there is a I don't know when Armadillo was published, I'm thinking it was late 90s. Um, but there's a, there's a strain on artificial intelligence, which is obviously an emerging topic then, and, and, and has particularly grabbed that author's mind. And he said, um, artificial intelligence, everybody is trying to create something terribly logical, but what makes humans interesting and really sometimes terribly creative is their ability to do something that's totally irrational and doesn't seem to make sense, but in some ways can be quite beautiful or, 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 or perhaps quite brilliant. Uh, and that struck with me. And then not everything I've written in a novel over the last 20 years has struck, stuck with me, but that has. Um, and I think it's very relevant in this context, because every single military campaign I can think of, we won't do a test here because you'll come up with one and I'll fail, uh, has a political military argument in it. You know, whether it's the military couldn't understand why Margaret Thatcher wanted us to take Goose Green in the Falklands, it wasn't on the main line of advance. Well, actually, there are very good political reasons for it. Um, and artificial intelligence itself, once again, I don't claim to be an expert, you know, is is not above producing things that we don't understand. Is it Move 8 or Move 5 or whatever, those who know about this in there? Uh, I think it was chess, wasn't it? Move 8 did something that absolutely no one could understand, but 20 moves down the line absolutely demonstrated a farsightedness that had never been seen before. So Move 8 is now used, I think, by artificial intelligence experts to describe that uh, strange event that you don't expect. So I think there are two sides to that coin. I think artificial intelligence, if you're right, can still show us things that we didn't think about that may be counterintuitive to us, but are right. And I would go back to the very good question right at the start, the you know, epistemology of all of this. We need to think through how we, how we program and use to make sure that the random is in there as well. Uh, I very much like the question on cultural elements to it, and I hope I addressed that. I hope I gave you some idea that I'm in, the, in this talk that I'm absolutely alive to unwitting bias. You know, we, should, we'd all, we all should be in every element of our, of our lives. That's why I mentioned the question I had on, you know, does, does the language in which you program artificial intelligence and the culture from which you come affect the way it works? And it does. And that's why I said we really need to investigate this. It's absolutely, it's very interesting. Yes, in the wargaming itself, having a red, a blue, and a green team who are all military guys of the same rank, same background, and guys, um, is, probably go, is probably going to skew things. And I was always struck by, when I was in, the, as mentioned, I did a few months, uh, nearly a year in the, in the Pentagon uh, and the British Embassy, by a company called Wikistrat that was one of the first to use the ability to do wargaming at speed um, if you used the net and the speed of computer-assisted gaming. And it used many, many teams around uh, the world. So you had global teams, and then you got various teams to play other different cultures. And at the time, everybody was interested. So this was 12, 13, uh, 2012 to 2013. Everyone was interested in how the standoff with Iran, the nuclear standoff, was going to play out, and everybody was wargaming that. And what I found really interesting um, was that regardless of how they played the game and many of the variables, they changed. And regardless of who played the players and how well or how badly, certain outcomes always trended. Uh, in this particular, that particular time, for example, whatever it did, Turkey always came out of it pretty well. Everything everyone else did enhanced Turkey's power. That then, to me, is an insight or something that you could you know, that you could use. At that time, and with the inputs, Israel didn't have many cards to play. One could therefore argue, given where we are now, eight years later, it played those cards pretty well. It could either do very badly or come out neutral. So, um, if I could link to the first answer, I think there is a lot to be thought through in how you structure the games. Uh, I'm very alive to the very valid point points you both made. Uh, uh, but I think you can structure games to take those factors into account. We have a gentleman in the back, and can we take the second question right over there? Good evening. Uh, Tarek Kuhl from the Cabinet Office. Sir, thank you very much for a very interesting talk and uh, some very thoughtful answers to very good questions. Following on from those, um, I suppose I have two. Firstly, when you talk about war games, is it just 
what I assume to be uh, the, the standard approach of what a war game looks like, war game is, uh, you have some sort of a mat, you have counters representing pieces, and you have an approach to deal with that, or does it go further than that? Does it include other types of games? Does it look at things such as interactive fiction, role-playing games, um, other types of board games, card games, simulations? And the question then is, how far does it go to reflect reality? How far does it go to actually addressing the key issue you want to learn? And to follow up that, how do you deal with assurance over this? You've mentioned dealing with biases, such as cognitive biases, other types. Um, uncertainty, how do you actually tie that into a game? But perhaps, how do you actually deal with actually getting the right kind of information uh, from the uh, intelligence world? The equivalent of wargaming there is usually red teaming. Uh, and that has a host of issues of you know, thinking like the enemy or thinking as the enemy. How do you actually work that in? And do you always need to do that? Thank you. Oh, good evening, sir. Clem Barber, I'm a captain in the Army Air Corps. Um, you mentioned the, the increase in computing power and assisting with wargaming. And now that we can run almost, a, almost an infinite number of permutations for any given situation, do you think there's a greater utility in wargaming in actually working out what the optimum start conditions are for any given scenario? And therefore, strategy can be based on achieving those start points uh, as they can be rather agnostic of adversary action. Thank you. Try, uh, yeah, I'll take, take both those. Both very good questions. Thank you. Um, there's a great variety of war games. As I said, I'd very much like to introduce them and will introduce them across the Defence Academy at various levels. Um, you can start off with a very simple rock drill, if that, make, if, if that, means, uh, if, if that means something. Uh, I think y you have introduced what everybody's classic view of a war game is, which is you know, the, the counters, the boards, the moves, the counter moves, the this, that, and the other. Um, but if you, uh, you remember what I spoke about with only a partial, it actually goes back to Western Approaches Tactical Unit, only having a partial sight of, what's go of, of what is going on, then um, absolutely you can move beyond, if you like, board and counter-based games with probability theories and, and turns and all the other bits and pieces. And yeah, certainly the computer-based elements, I think, allows you to configure in, in any way that you wish. And so um, you get to the end where, you get to the point, sorry, where your wargaming and your exercising is, comes together. So if you put 4,000 people on Senelaga planes, we used to do with the Allied um, uh, re Reaction Corps, Rapid Reaction Corps, um, and they are testing new concepts. Is that a wargaming? Is that just an exercise? It certainly doesn't involve a board. It does involve a white force somewhere coming up with decisions, and it will involve, it, it will involve a red team. Um, does, is it important, do you follow on, that the red team um, work is done or we even think through? You might want to put some strange responses in to test people in certain, you know, in different ways. And I, I wrestle with this daily, uh, where I have a couple of two-star officers, one who runs the exercises and one who owns the headquarters, both of whom think they own the exercise. It's amazing how we talk about cultural diversity. By, by, yeah, by golly, you should see it between the Army and the Air Force sometimes. Um, and so, you know, there's the struggle between the commander wants to use the exercise to train his force and the exercise owner wants to use the exercise to experiment and put the commander under stress. Both of those would run the game very differently. So I, I think there are, um, there are no real answers that are, well, no, there are lots of answers, but there are no absolute answers. And I think as we you know, regain the habit of war game, what we need to do is guide people to be able to structure exercises such that the answers they get out, we can be as confident as possible while having done some assessment of what the, um, the boundaries, the margins of error are around that, accepting, as I said in my talk, nothing's ever perfect. And so your assurance element is something we absolutely wrestle with when we go into synthetic environment. And um, if I could move from wargaming to something that really is pure training, um, but those nations that operate very high-tech, say, air platforms, stealth platforms, have been operating in simulators that are locked away underground in very, very top-secret areas. And that's where the best training is had. 
if what the simulator is doing and the war games played in there are not right, then that could be very, very damaging for your operational capability. They have certain ways of validating it, and then there are ways of using the real world to as best you can. On the few times you can do some very expensive live flying training to validate what you found in the simulator. I would imagine, therefore, that, as I've just mentioned with my, you know, the, the continual uh, referee I have between a couple of my subordinates at the moment, somewhere between the live and the virtual, uh, in that construct, has to be an element of cross-checking and, uh, and coming out with some answers. Uh, and as for do we war game other than, if you like, once you cross the start line, yes, absolutely. And in the uh, you know, preceding remarks when we've talked about inflection points and the nature of the world today, I just want to make it clear that we're trying to use war gaming to avoid conflict. This is not just war gaming to be better at it. This is not trying to get to the Cold War mentality where the hooter goes, you've got 20 minutes and, and we, will all, we, we will all be brilliant. Um, here I raise uh, yeah, Israel again, who, uh, well, my understanding, once again, it's imperfect, but will regularly war game how to de-escalate. And some measures, as we've seen, as we look ac across the rather competitive world we live in at the moment, where the, the line escalate to de-escalate has now become quite, uh, quite well worn. But we certainly want to use war gaming to, in a supporter of our deterrent posture, and part of that surely is, as you've outlined, proving and working out how you would get to a point where the calculation of the opposition would be you have achieved such a point of advantage at the start that it's not in their interest to trigger a conflict. Uh, and that's why in the speech we also mentioned using wargaming and how you might publish the results of it um, to bolster your position in a deterrence sense. So we'll take two questions, one up front here and, and Thank you. Um, good evening, sir. Captain Thorburn, Royal Signals, and I'm also on the external academic placement here at King's. Um, three questions that all effectively link into each other. The first one is, how far down the command levels do you, or would you like to see wargaming conducted? And then with that in mind, how do you reconcile some of the problems that are faced by commanders to meet collective training objectives with relatively short spans of time to train and access to training areas? And then with both of those two questions in mind, what do you need from your junior officers, SO3s, SO2s, to help you in this grand endeavor? Thank you. I, um, I gave what was probably a far too serious talk to the Intermediate Command and Staff Course land um, around Armistice Day. Um, I think they probably wanted a few after-dinner jokes, but one of the things I'd found out the average age of the course, and this is major level mostly, was about three years younger than um, Macron had become President of France or George Osborne had become Chancellor of the Exchequer. And, and given that's probably the first exposure of anybody to war game, it strikes me as it's too late. So I think it's not just a matter of com command levels. I think there is a need to inculcate the understanding of war game uh, at, a much er at, you know, at a much earlier level. Of course, that's not necessarily the command level, um, but uh, given where junior officers might spend their first time you know, at staff is probably brigade level, then we definitely need to um, reimagine the culture at that level. Um, the availability of areas to exercise. If you get the wargaming right, then it's amazing how cheap it can be. I was always struck. I'm a, I'm a big fan of technology demonstrator programs because it strikes me that when people don't believe there's a contract to be had at the end of it, they do really imaginative things with not a lot of money. And uh, it was actually the Air Force that came up with a thing called the Air Battle Space Training Center in a windy hangar in easternmost Lincolnshire and I went there in January. There are fewer places colder. Uh, and it had been adapted to uh, represent elements of a command environment in Helmand in the height of summer. You would therefore immediately think this would never work. And indeed, no doubt there'd been a contract in the offing. Someone would have invested in heaters and sand and all sorts of things to try and make it feel like the environment. 
because the elements presented to the decision makers in this environment were so realistic, everybody got absolutely immersed in it. And I suppose this is a bit of an answer to the verification question that came, that came back. When some of those brigades then came out of some of the most uh, hard-fought fighting in 2010, remember Panchar Palang, I think, was the, the operation? Um, it was Tim Radford's uh, brigade at the time. Part of their after-action reports from that awful period in, in, in Helmand then was the worst day in, in Helmand was just like the end of the exercise mountain dragon in that hangar in Lincolnshire. And I came away thinking we need to be doing a heck of a lot more of this because this was just a technology demonstrator program almost knocked up with bits of four by two and some laptops and screens and other things that were representative of what you might see on a laptop in a uh, brigade headquarters or even at a forward observation post. So I think um, when you say, do we have the resources to train, we could be a lot more imaginative in how we do the training. And I could give you two or three more examples. Very briefly, when we put some rather advanced technology on the Jaguar and I was flying it, we were luckily, we were approached by a video gaming company that just wanted to pluck our, in, our IPR, if you like, because we knew how this high-tech system represented in the cockpit, and they were producing a game called Eurofighter 2000, so that tells you how long ago that was. And so we told them how all this worked and the functionality, and they put it in the computer game, and we said, well, what we'd like back is we'd like you to take this computer thing and just give us a system so we can train pilots. That cost 5,000 pounds per system. It cost 10,000 pounds an hour to fly a Jaguar. So if you used it once and threw it away, you were saving 50% of the cost of, of, of flying and pilots could just go on this thing because there weren't many to be, not much training to be had, so back to your point about scarce resources. And they could just go and do almost like a video game, but 10, 20 minutes to keep the piano fingers going as you played with all these new extra buttons and switches and, and what have you, 5,000 pounds. The normal route, which until the video company, came, the games company came along, the normal route to procurement was going to look at the full swept up flight simulator for the Jaguar. And the company was going to charge us millions of pounds and take about 18 months to upgrade the software in that. So I'm all for innovation and imaginative solutions, and my, you know, I'll be persuaded against it, but I think if we get back into the culture of wargaming, we work with things like the games industry, we are doing on this technology demonstrator program, then, and you use you know, the cloud to be able to run your sort of off-site processing for all of this, I think you'd be surprised how easily, cheaply, and effectively you can introduce wargaming at all levels. Does that? It's quite a strident answer. Um, yeah, no, no, no do. I'm just wondering if I got, um, I think I got commanding train and junior, junior officers. Um, I think the current, the one bit I've missed your answer, the current cohort of junior officers comes in with a much more questioning mindset, um, comes in with a desire to have an interesting life that may involve being in the military for a bit, it may involve being in for longer, but it's certainly not with the idea to being definitely being a general in 25, 30 years time. Uh, and I think they are a very, very good cohort uh, because of that natural curiosity and maybe a slightly less ingrained deference to use the sort of tools that we've talked about today to really test and probe the system. So I think your question was, how can we best use junior officers? I think the answer might be where we started with the vignette, taking 17-year-old Wrens in, teaching them the absolute, this is how it works, and allowing the imagination to flow caused some salty old sea dogs to, to think twice. And I think we need to uh, embrace the new types of thinking that come in with every, with every cohort and flatten some of the decision-making structures. Hello, sir. Paul Kendall from the Royal Air Force. Um, I'm, this may follow on quite nicely with this one, but I'm, I'm struck you uh, said in order to make uh, wargaming routine again, we need more qualified personnel. Mm. And I'd be interested to know how you imagine we're going to do that. And I, the reason I ask as context is that thinking back over my last sort of 10 years of service in wargaming, I've been uh, directly staff at Staff College. Um, I've been in the Joint Force Air Component Headquarters using wargaming and ops and exercises. I've participated in the Title 10 war games that you referred to in the US. I've even done a wiki strat. Um, but I've never yet met a wargaming instructor. 
No, because like many of the competencies in, let's just stick with your and my service, you've probably met some fantastic space experts as well. Um, do you know where our space school is either? No, because in certain areas where we need the competence, we saw the grow it and on the job training, which is where you got all yours and I recognize your, I recognize your experience. And the idea through all of this is it, it gives us, it's part of the British national disease, isn't it, in some ways. You know, we, um, all our best automotive engineers go overseas, apart from the ones so we build about 20 Formula One cars in the M40 corridor, but we don't have Toyota. Um, yeah, so, same with Hi-Fi. So we have some real experts in the country, but we don't uh, take a systemic approach. So... If I am going to achieve my ambition across the Defence Academy of making sure everybody comes in to do a course, does some war gaming at whatever level, then we are going to have to generate uh, the course. And uh, it's one of the things that Defence Academy does. Through which faculty at the moment, I don't know. I've got several that I, that I could use. But if the governance structure that I mentioned earlier is going to accredit war games, then in that awful military MOD parlance, SQUEP, suitably qualified and experienced personnel, then we're going to have to have people who can accredit the war games. And how do you accredit them? And you can only do it through the ways we do in those things that traditionally we do value, air crew or what have you, very, very swept up training systems and systems of accreditation. So we know how to do that. We just have to pull the relevant expertise into the same little area and make it so. Hi, uh, Max Valentine, Business Strategies. Um, we've talked about AlphaGo. Uh, it's very much based on data in, output out. Um, but we're very much on the cusp of quantum computers at the moment, mm. uh, which may see you know, output in uh, require data out. Uh, I'm just wondering how that's going to affect on war games training. Uh, I know enough about quantum computing to know I'm immediately in the Rumsfeld world here. So I'm going to own up to a huge number of known unknowns. Um, but a couple of recent visits down to people who really do know about this, I ended up coming away with my mind more blown by quantum crypto and other bits and pieces uh, that uh, uh, I can't give you a definitive answer. What I believe I know uh, about quantum computing is you have to make sure you ask it the right questions. This is not just supercomputers cheaper or using you know, low technology semiconductors, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the way they work and process data is fundamentally different and at the moment offers itself up to a certain type of problem solving. I think it's don't have to be linear. Um, now, I've got a feeling you probably know more about quantum computing than I do. My sense, though, is um, that I, as this becomes more mainstream, and as I believe what it is good is at finding patterns and sorting through realms of data, what I talked about in our use of, if we move to a policy in defense based around information advantage and data, where data is an asset to be stored and cherished and sought out and used, and therefore data from games both takes from that pool and contributes to it, then we are going to need to think through Oh, sorry, as opposed to what I, is data is just a cost, which certainly in my early years in the service, you know, every six months go into the registry and shred some files because they're taking up far too much space. Um, my sense is that quantum computing could provide us with the ability to crunch a huge amount of, the, uh, amount of that data. Whether it, therefore, whether it provides a tool for the actual gaming itself, I don't know. But I know enough to know that what I don't know needs are gaps that need filling in. Um, and I, I strongly suspect that it, that it will have a great utility. But I'm willing to be corrected. And we've got time for one last question. Do we go down, down here? Thank you, sir. Alan Jenkins, ex Air Force and in the cyber world. Um, how do you think the fifth domain, as I think it's now called, in terms of non-kinetic activity into the kinetic world, how do you think that'll change the civil military piece? Because I'm kind of thinking that the politicians' piece outside of the military, who ultimately make the decisions, they're short-term thinking, not long-term thinking, and your doctrine is going to more long-term thinking 
to influence forced development. I think those are going in opposite directions. Uh, how do we model that? Um, um. That, you know, the point about the short-term thinking is often, you know, often raised, um, uh, not only because this is on the record, is it a fantastic trap for military chaps to fall into, but as I've said, you know, we t our, our job is to give absolutely unfettered best military advice. It's not to, it is not to play at politics, and, you know, I'm not falling into the trap of, uh, you know, assuming Alan Book was a brilliant strategist and Churchill was just ever so slightly batty every now and again. I don't believe it. And um, in many of the operations I was involved in, certainly my last job as essentially the operations director, um, I found that the insight and the risk appetite and the ability to cut through to the really important points was demonstrated in COBRA by some of the senior and very experienced politicians, while officials were still stroking their chins and saying, let's wait a bit longer. Um, so I am. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'd accept that it's as binary as, as you put across. Uh, that, that said, um, it is you know, quite striking that the Chinese could set out on a particular political direction in 78, and, uh, and 78 through 82, Deng Xiaoping and what have you, has by and large you know, been you know, been, been followed, but there are pitfalls in that as well. If you're on the wrong direction, that's equally harmful. Um, and I think that, you know, the history of democratic accountability, bear in mind where we are and the day we're talking here, by and large has done us quite well. And therefore, you know, we are in the business of trying to protect the rule-based international order. Um, it does seem to look after its citizens better than most other ways of, ways of government. The cyber element you mentioned I, once again, I'm sorry to come across as negative, but I think that's a little bit of a false distinction. And it, here, I think our problems are that cyber has been seen as the province of GCHQ for reasons that it first surfaced in the sort of intelligence realm. So GCHQ became um, very closely, and still is very closely associated with our cyber capability for obvious reasons to do with crypto and to do with the intelligence aspects, and now very much the, you know, the, the secrecy of it. Um, but we're already seeing it branch out, aren't we? I mean, the, the National Cyber Security Centre down at Victoria is a lot more open um, as, as, a, you know, as, as, as a structure. And I think it's only going to ever get more open because we have to talk through how we protect critical national infrastructure in this country when much of it is in private hands or private companies or, or, or what have you. We started with the Second World War as an example here. It strikes me that questions then were easier because the physical protection of geographic boundaries absolutely fell to the services you know in three-dimensional sovereign territory is policed by the three armed services and actually there weren't many ways then to break into that and do harm to your to uh, to another state across that political boundary without some form of mechanical intrusion which is clearly an act of war so I can see where you're going with you know, the, thinking through some of the threats we face at the moment but it is just another domain uh, and when and, you know, when you think that one through and work out how the state protects elements vital to it and protects its citizens, you could think of cybercrime, used by some states against us by proxies not too far removed, um, then I think the difficulties, they, they transform in front of you, they become manageable. Yes, it's more complicated, but I don't think it's as complex as, as some people make out. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome again to Strategic Wargaming Week. We hope to see you at uh, our um, events later this week. And please join us uh, for um, a reception at the Philosophy Bar. You've got the information for that in, in front of you. And join me again in, in uh, thanking Air Marshal Stringer. Thank you, Vanka. Thank you, Vanka. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.